address those questions. Um, the chat box is there for you to chat uh, between yourselves, um, offer up any information, um, and if you want, if you're able to um, introduce yourself and let us know where you're from today. This webinar is being recorded. Our donors are for the for this webinar are USAID, CEDA, Irish Aid, Save the Children, and UNICEF. And as a disclaimer, this webinar is made possible by the generous support of our donors, but the contents aren't, are the responsibility of the Tech RT and the individual presenters and do not necessarily reflect the view of the donors. We have translation available for this webinar today. We have Nassim and Hirada uh, doing the Arabic, uh, Christian and Joanne in, uh, providing French translation, and Carla and Anna providing the Spanish translation. And you'll be able to see at the bottom of your screen the tab where you can switch between, um, between those options. And I'll hand it over to Deborah. Thank you very much. Yeah, greetings, everyone. So today we're going to, um, could we move the slide on please? Um, yeah, so we're going to, um, today we're going to see presentations from Syria, from Sierra Leone, um, Lebanon, and then we're going to have an interactive quiz um, with questions and answers. Um, and then after the webinar, we'd greatly appreciate if you could do um, fill in the survey of the evaluation. Um, that would be great. So we will be giving examples within the case studies of the COVID-19 program adaptations, um, learning and sharing about these. And also, while you're looking at these, consider how the operational guidance is um, being used within the programming. I'll now move forward and introduce the presenters for today's uh, webinar. If you could, uh, presenters, please turn your video on when you're introduced, um, and that would be great. So first of all, we've got Leila Madwa. From the, she's the Health and Nutrition Officer for UNICEF uh, Field Office Kamisli, sorry, my pronunciation, in Syria. Yeah, hi everyone. This is Laila. Um, yeah, I'm based in Kamishli Field Office in Syria. I'm the health and nutrition officer there with UNICEF and I lead the nutrition subsector as well. Thank you. Great. Christy Smith, Health and Nutrition Head of Department, Action Against Hunger, Sierra Leone. Hello, everyone. Um, then we have Bayan Ahmad, uh, Senior Field Officer, International Orthodox Christian Charities, or otherwise known as IOCC. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bayan Ahmad. I'm from Lebanon, and I work for the International Orthodox Christian Charities as a Senior Field Officer. Thank you. Um, then we're going to, after the presentations, it's going to follow a really fun interactive quiz um, and Ashima from UNICEF headquarters will be leading this. Hello everyone, Ashima Desaid, uh, I work with UNICEF uh, in New York office. Then a question and answer um, session. Now during the webinar, if you could kindly put your question and answers into the question and answer um, section, it's like a little chat box at the bottom, keep it separate from the chat box. So all the questions go in the Q&A section. Um, if you'd like to um, add any comments, any other comments, and also your name um, affiliation within the chat box, that would be really great to um, share that information with us. So, um, yeah, so would you be able to move on the presentation now, please? Great. So, first of all, we have Leila um, from the UNICEF Syria, if you'd like to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, yeah, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. This is Leila again um, from Syria Commissary Field Office. Um, I'm the health and nutrition officer, like I said, and I lead the nutrition subsector as well. Um, next slide, please. 
So today's presentation um, is mainly outlining the life-saving intervention that we fashioned or we started in 2019 until now, which, uh, which focuses on the relactation process after the separation between mothers and their infants in camp setting. Our experience specifically is in a hot camp. Next slide. So this is, a, this is a map of Syria and the, the black arrow is pointing at the approximate location of al Hol camp where our intervention is. It's located in al Hazaka governorate and uh, it's under the self-administration control. So it's outside of the government control. Um, at the onset of the emergency, the displacement emergency started in late December, 2018 and continued uh, until April 2019, where masses of women and children moved from, uh, from their resort, which is south of the country, up to al Hol camp in a very exhausting journey. Most of uh, the journey was on foot, and it took them up to two weeks to make it to the camp. Next slide, please. So the camp, before the emergency, the camp used to host uh, up to 10,000 individuals, but after this displacement, is, it hosted up to 74,000 um, individuals. 66% 60, of them are under 18. 25% um, of those are under five years old, and 94 of the camp population are women and children. So, um, in the camp, we have different nationalities. So we have Iraqis, we have Syrians, we have foreign uh, women and children from 60 different nationalities. Um, the majority of those families, especially those who came, uh, especially those who came after the displacement, are families who came from an area that was besieged for five years. So they had no health or food nutrition services. Um, this area was under the control of ISIS during those five years as well. Um, the camp is basically divided into eight uh, sections. The Iraqi Syrians and the foreigners are all separated. Um, the movement of mothers outside the camp was prohibited completely at first, but now uh, it is extremely complicated process, which is led by the camp management and the self-administration security forces. So this, uh, uh, this limited movement outside the camp includes um, any external health referral of children or of mothers to secondary health care facilities outside the camp. And due to the high gamma rate that we encountered among those children under five, um, we had to refer over 500 children to hospitals outside the camp for acute malnutrition treatment mainly. And this was only approved by the camp management and security if the child was referred alone without the mother. So this is the main reason, or this caused the separation between breastfeeding mothers and their children. Next slide, please. So um, regarding any, any pre-crisis data that we have, we only have um, data from a rapid IYCF e-assessment that uh, you, uh, Save the Children and UNICEF conducted at the onset of the displacement when mothers were still in the reception area in the camp. So this assessment served as a baseline data for our IYCF intervention. Um, we covered 970 mothers of breastfeeding children under two. The field workers used a simple random sampling methodology. They used the, the, the default questionnaire that Save the Children has on rapid assessment of IYCFE. We did it in Arabic and we could not include the foreigners in our assessment. Um, the camp, of course, has expanded since then. It changed a lot, so those results are not representative of the situation anymore, but it was only our, um, like our kickoff point where we uh, designed the intervention for this, uh, for this displacement. Um, the results basically reflect a good basic knowledge and good even practice of mothers before coming to the camp. And we speculate that due to, the, to their living arrangements of their original location in their resort, mothers felt obliged to rely on breastfeeding children rather than on food or even infant formula, which was a rarity in their resort. So this could explain the 0% of non-breastfeeding mothers. Um, we've also had a portion of mothers who exclusively breastfed children who were 12 months old or, or younger. So um, the, this also assessment data showed that 30% of, of children that we um, screened 
were not introduced to food and they were 12 months old at the time of the assessment. So this is an indication that mother's behavior was born out of circumstances rather than knowledge of optimal feeding practices. Um, we don't really have much information on the food pattern of infants and young children prior to their displacement. Uh, the families were definitely food insecure the, um, and the, they did not have food diversity. Their access to food was compromised. Availability of food is, was also an issue. Next slide, please. Um, so the, prior to this emergency, UNICEF had a very basic IYCF programming. Uh, they relied, uh, the, the IYCF relied mainly on group counseling sessions for breastfeeding and pregnant women. And the counselors who delivered those group counseling had very basic knowledge about IYCF practices. So individual counseling, um, they did not do it in a systematic process um, and they were not able to provide sufficient technical advisory to mothers. That was the case before the emergency. This was why we had a severe gap after the onset of the displacement. And the next slide will, will outline the reason. Um, so the original IYCF program was trained greatly before, uh, because of the following reasons. Uh, first, we have a high acute malnutrition um, GAM rate. It was at all time high in the, in the camp, like I said, and we had to refer over 500 children outside the camp, and they had to be separated from their um, breastfeeding mothers, basically, uh, due to security issues. Um, and at the beginning of the displacement and due to the exhaustion of mothers and and children during the journey, there was a high mortality rate of children under one years of age. A lot of children stopped breastfeeding either along the way or after arriving. Mothers also stopped uh, breastfeeding at, at the arrival of the camp. They refused initiation of breastfeeding. Um, they did not have enough psychosocial support uh, upon arrival to the camp. And this leads us to talk about the preparedness for this emergency. It was very weak from all humanitarian actors. It was mainly due to lack of information shared uh, from the authorities about the number of expected mothers and children and the caseload. Um, the, the, because it was a very highly political decision to allow people to move from their resort to alcohol camp. So agencies were not really prepared um, and they were not allowed to uh, receive information from the responsible um, authorities. Um, lastly, infant formulas were heavily pro promoted by local charities. Um, so they were distributed among mothers who had just arrived to the camp in the reception area with no prior assessment, no coordination with the sector. Um, and of course, this was a, a violation of the International BMS Code of Donation. Um, but yeah, that was that happened without uh, preparation because, it, like I said, this was a very rapid emergency that nobody was prepared for. Um, next slide, please. So the adaptations that we took um, in order to mitigate, if you will, and to expand our program is that at the onset of the emergency, as a sector, nutrition sector, presented by UNICEF mainly, started under the guidance of the IYCFE operational guidance to promote complying by the international BMS code, especially in terms of donation. This was a priority. The guidance was also utilized as a core tool to adapt elements of the existing IYCF services, which includes individual counseling. And we focused on relaxation process for mothers who were newly reunited with their infants because the infants were referred to, to hospitals sometimes like as soon as they made it to the camp, they did not even make it to the tent. Um, we conducted um, capacity building activities, so we increased the human resources working in the camp, mainly counselors, and to cover uh, the huge increase of, comp of camp population, we had to increase uh, uh, threefold the, no the number of counselors that we had. We provided specialized training for individual counseling. Um, we focused on relactation process and supporting infants who relied on BMS during the relactation process. Um, and lastly, we integrated child protection services with IYCFE services, which includes um, 
establishing a strong referral pathway between the caregivers who identified separated cases, accompanied the child to the hospital and helped with the reunification with the mother in the camp after the treatment was finished. So those caregivers were linked with the IYCF counselors who approached the interested mothers and provided the appropriate consultations um, to, to start the relactating process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, the, so to explain a little more than a, a little bit technically about this uh, process, um, so the, we, uh, we divided this process into two phases. We have the first phase, which starts uh, on the left, which starts by the identification of a child to be referred outside the camp, either by health or nutrition actors. The identification, um, uh, sorry, the restriction then on, imposed on mothers by the security and camp management prevents those mothers from accompanying the child to the hospital. So if the child is breastfeeding, this causes a disruption of their feeding practice. So the referring agency contacts a child protection agency to provide the necessary caregiver to accompany the child. This caregiver is from outside the camp, by the way, to accompany the child to the hospital um, in absence of their mothers. And then the same caregiver would contact the counselor, the IYCF counselor from UNICEF, if the child is breastfeeding. The counselor then would approach the mother for consultations during the child's absence. Uh, it's mainly, a, they mainly try to raise awareness about how important it is to continuously expressing milk while the child is absent. Um, some mothers breastfed other children in the camp, so they acted as wet nurses during the absence of that child. Uh, some mothers did not wish to continue breastfeeding. Some mothers did not feel comfortable expressing their milk by hand in a cup. Some mothers, uh, some mothers felt comfortable enough, but unfortunately, because of the difficult circumstances, we could not transfer the, the milk to the child. Um, so it varied. The, the mother's response is different depending on age, background, etc. The second phase starts when the child comes back to the camp and is reunited with the mother through the caregiver. Um, the counselor then initiate their tent visit to the mother and the child. Um, the first advisory they give to the mother is explain the importance of breastfeeding, especially for children under six months of age, especially for those living in such hardship where wash facilities are compromised, uh, the hygiene practices are not optimal, etc. So we had, um, so for mothers who do agree to receive help to, re to start the relactation, the process goes on, the process starts. So we had mothers who completely lost their breast milk because the child was, um, was out for a month maybe, um, and they started using infant formula. So the process is using a feeding tube that we attach to the mother's breast where the, the, the child receives the milk through the tube and sucks at the mother's breast simultaneously. Uh, another case is where the mother did, uh, did not lose the milk completely. They still have a decreased milk flow, but, but they're not satisfied with the session. So they are provided with the default advisory on position latching, et cetera. Um, so on, on average, the, the, the relactation processes that we supervised or that we provided took between 14 to 35 uh, to 34 days, depending on the mother. Uh, most of the mothers who consented to start the relactation were those of children under six months of age. Um, uh, unfortunately, we did not really have, we don't have statistics to show the scope of our intervention. Um, but yeah, but that's the information that we have. Next slide, please. So um, just want to talk quickly about COVID-19 in this slide where we, we a UNICEF in coordination with Ministry of Health established and disseminated a guideline for IYCF program under COVID-19 because of course the, uh, the movement into the camp by those counselors were prohibited during COVID-19. So um, what we did is we suspended the group counseling sessions and replace them with individual counseling where the counselors who have PPEs and who abide by respiratory etiquette and hand hygiene, they were of course properly trained on IPC measures, would visit mothers who have children under six months of age 
or mothers who are on a relactation journey. This is just not to uh, not to suspend the service that we provided. Um, individual counseling, so we eliminated the group counseling and the mother support groups, and we focused on individual counseling for specific criteria of mothers. Um, that was during the first four months of COVID-19, but then since August, um, that, uh, that ban basically, or that restriction of movement uh, were lifted. So we are back to group counseling of um, under controlled environment. Um, and individual counseling is now happening on a more uh, wide scale. Next slide, please. So going back to the, to the original emergency, the main, the main challenges um, were the, the sudden inflation of the camp population, like I said, uh, and the lack of a good preparedness plan, um, the, the cultural and religious backgrounds of different nationalities were actually pretty problematic for us where uh, we needed very specific uh, methods to approach mothers and to advocate for breastfeeding practices, especially in terms of relactation, which was a very new concept for the majority of the population. So we really relied on the C4D, um, the Communication for Development team in raising awareness and approaching those at the community. In 2019, also we suffered from acute wash related issues. We had the, the quality and quantity of drinking water were below the sphere standards, so that directly affected the infants who were on BMS support. Next slide, please. So there are two elements, I would say, that helped us establish a successful response. Um, first, it's a, we have a strong um, C4D team in the camp. So this team basically represents the link between the community and the clinic. The clinic is the, the part of the clinic is the counselors. So this team includes a network of community leaders, local workers who helped uh, the referral process, who helped us gain the trust of the population in order to hand us their children, to treat them, and then to trust us to, um, uh, to help them establish breastfeeding again. Uh, and then another, another element is um, a, the fact that we had a close coordination with other sectors. So with health sector and child protection sectors, we managed to create a comprehensive response starting from detection of acute malnutrition, safe external referral of the child without the mother, optimal treatment of acute malnutrition, and finally reuni uh, reuniting the child with the mother and linking them with the IYCFE services needed. Next slide. Um, this is basically the same uh, of what I said before. T to us, um, the, the link with the community leaders and approaching this intervention through the community has worked best. It did not work as much when we went to the stakeholders directly or when we went to the camp management. Um, we also have mother support groups, which are part of the group counseling sessions. A mother talked about their experiences or not talked about their experiences, to be honest. They're not that outspoken, but they answered questions from their peers uh, in those group sessions. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so finally, the top three lessons that we learned from our experience is first, the importance of the close coordination with other sectors. This has definitely broadened our pro program's reach, especially since, uh, to us, especially if it's an undermined program like IYCF during the, the emergency. Um, it will also ensure a complementary health program, so will provide a safe service for an already vulnerable population. Uh, second, uh, closed camps with restriction of movement need a really comprehensive and complicated intervention, multi-layered even. We have a lot of uh, separation incidents between mothers and infants in such camps. Lastly, the importance of communication for development, the C4D, and participation of beneficiaries in the advocacy for IYCFE activities. Um, uh, the ideas that I would give for other context is perhaps is not to neglect the advocacy for application of the International Code of BMS uh, for marketing and donations to prevent those donations during uh, the onset of the emergency, because everything is so hectic and so fast during the emergency. So um, I, I would say that not to neglect the advocacy for that before the emergency. And secondly, is to always look at ways where we can integrate IYCF services with uh, other programs.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, um, Laila. Um, that was really interesting. Um, the response, you know, within the camp situation and the Syria context. Now we're going to move on um, through to Sierra Leone and Christy from Action Against Hunger will do the presentation on IYCF programming during COVID-19. Thank you. Please um, remember to put your um, questions and answer into the um, question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Thanks, Christy. Great, thank you so much, Deborah. Hi, everyone. My name is Christy, and I'm the Health and Nutrition Head of Department for Sierra Leone and Liberia with Action Against Hunger. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Mohamed Sesse, from one of our local implementing partners, Cowick. He's joining us from the field today, but he'll be available during the question and answer session. Uh, next slide, please. So Sierra Leone is located in West Africa on the Atlantic coast and the IYTF programming we'll be discussing today has been implemented in the Western area, which is that small purple region that's in the map above and highlighted bigger below. So this area includes the capital of Freetown and Western area urban and the surrounding peninsula, which is Western area rural. Uh, the context of Sierra Leone is largely defined by several events, including conflict and environmental sh uh, shocks in recent years. There was a decade-long civil war ending in 2002, where 70,000 people lost their lives and 2.6 million people were displaced, which is quite significant in a country of just 7 million people. The Ebola virus was here from 2014 to 2015, and Sierra Leone experienced the highest number of confirmed cases compared to other countries, and with a death total of just under 4,000. Uh, we also have a very long and very wet rainy season here and this contributed to a massive mudslide in 2017 that took place in the western area and as well as a significant flooding episode from 2019 that caused a lot of destruction to infrastructure and also uh, wiped out shelter for 5,000 people. And while Sierra Leone has seen significant economic growth in recent years, it still suffers from post-conflict issues. There's high levels of youth unemployment. 80% of the population here is under the age of 35, and it's estimated that 60% of these people are unemployed. Uh, there's corruption, weak governance, poor infrastructure, fragile health systems, and also we're seeing an increasing amount of food insecurity with nearly 48% of the population here being food insecure. And of course, now we're in the COVID-19 context, Sierra Leone confirmed its index case in March, and there are approximately just over 2,300 confirmed cases in the country. Next slide, please. So IYCF practices prior to the onset of COVID-19. So we have statistics here from the Sierra Leone Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey that was conducted nationwide um, in 2017. So it's a little bit blurry on my screen, so I can't quite see the numbers, but I will let you take a look for yourself. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't see them well enough to read them to you, but my connection's not so fine. Uh, but moving on, let's go to the next slide, please. So prior to the onset of COVID-19, the IYCF programming that we were implementing was being done through a three-year project that we refer to as PROSAM. So it's an AFD funded project that Action Against Hunger is implementing in three countries, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and the Ivory, and Ivory Coast, with the overall aim at strengthening health systems and services. The IYCF component has done through, ex uh, through engagement with existing community structures, namely mother and father support groups. So we trained lead mothers and lead fathers on IYCF and care practices. And then these leaders returned to their communities and to the support groups that they managed to cascade this information. This has been done through three main avenues, including individual counseling, so going door to door to support pregnant and lactating women on these topics, conducting regular bi-monthly support group meetings with each meeting focused on a different topic, such as maternal nutrition, exclusive breastfeeding, et cetera. Uh, and this was an opportunity for group members to share their experience and to learn from each other. And then lastly, the leading mothers and fathers also conducted community awareness and raising, community awareness and raising uh, education sessions with key stakeholders from their community so that this information could be shared with the community at large. 
Next slide, please. So West Africa was one of the last places to have confirmed COVID-19 cases. So by the time we had our, uh, our first index case here in March, the government had already implemented precautionary measures and there was quite a bit of buzz that had generated about the pandemic as everyone had watched it unfold uh, around the rest of the world. So when the first case was confirmed, the individual counseling sessions that the lead mothers and fathers led stopped. Both the lead mothers and fathers and community members feared transmission, the bi-monthly support group meetings also were suspended. This action against hunger as an organization, we uh, suspended all community engagement activities that drew a crowd um, and group members also feared transmission. The education and awareness raising sessions also stopped for similar reasons and the government had imposed a limit on the group gathering sizes, so those were suspended. And just in general, um, the, there was a lot of confusion around the COVID-19 precautionary measures, there was changing messages and people weren't quite sure of what to do, so this made program activity implementation difficult to continue. Next slide please. So with the onset of COVID-19, one of the first things that we did was to conduct a rapid behavior assessment with the communities we were working with. We surveyed 560 people about their knowledge of COVID-19, what precautionary measures they were following and what sources of information they were accessing and how much they trusted each source of information. We used this data to inform how we were going to reprogram our IYCF and care practice activities in this new context. So we wanted our, to enable our lead mothers and fathers to continue to engage with the support group members as well as the community members at large to cascade this information in a way that was safe. So USAID had released IYCF counseling cards for COVID-19 with resources to adapt to various contexts. So we use this resource, these resources to train lead mothers and fathers on these counseling materials. And so that's what these photos are from the training sessions that we held. Um, so the lead mothers and fathers could resume the individual level counseling in their communities going door to door to target pregnant and lactating women and caregivers on IYCF and also to promote health seeking behaviors and encouraging women to attend all necessary appointments at health centers. This was a major problem during the Ebola outbreak. People stopped going to health centers out of fear of transmission and stigma. So it was a big priority for us in our reprogramming. Next slide, please. From the rapid behavior assessment that we conducted, community members reported relying on community leaders and stakeholders as well as the radio as information regarding COVID-19. So we wanted to be sure to engage the broader community with these mediums. So we organized community question and answer sessions regarding COVID-19 with an emphasis on IYCF and care practices. So key stakeholders such as village chiefs, religious leaders, traditional healers, et cetera, were invited to come. And we hosted these sessions with the district health management team members. And so it created a platform to uh, discuss COVID-19 perceptions, help dispel myths and outline current precautionary measures. And then to reach a larger audience with these measures, with messages, we targeted people through the radio. So we developed and aired informative jingles regarding COVID-19 and IYCF practices. And additionally, we hosted re uh, weekly radio panel discussions with members from the district health management teams. Listeners were invited to call in with their questions. And additionally, we used PA systems, public announcement systems, and market areas and other key areas to share important messages and also create space for uh, people to ask questions. So you can see that's what we're doing in the bottom. Next slide. So now we have a testimonial from one of our lead mothers. So this woman was originally trained as a lead mother with Action Against Hunger back in 2014. So she's been working with her support group since then. And she received the training on IYCF during COVID-19 and is now providing individual counseling uh, to women in her community. And she has personal experience with the pandemic as her daughter tested positive and she and her family were quarantined for two weeks. So we have a video, it's in Creole, so we'll give you a taste of the language and then it will be muted and I will give uh, the English translation.
Me na married woman I old 35 years. I get three picking then one boy. I am a married woman. I'm 35 years old. I have three kids, one boy and two girls. I came to know Action Against Hunger. At the time, they called the community stakeholders to have a meeting at Lumpa Community Health Center. I was invited to this meeting and they chose me to be a lead mother. They trained me to be a lead mother in 2014. I have been with them for six years. The name of my mother's support group is Good Heart Combra means nursing mother. Mm -hmm. They trained us lead mothers to take care of pregnant women, children, and nursing mothers. I have been working with them hand in hand. Anytime they call for a training, they train us, and that's how we train pregnant women and nursing mothers. When they teach us, we come back and teach the pregnant and nursing mothers. It even made the death rate decrease at the hospitals because some of the women were not going to hospitals before. Through Action Against Hunger's teaching, people have started coming to the clinic. The community people are used to me and I'm the one talking to the people to come to the clinic and when I talk, they listen. My experience with coronavirus is plenty. It's really been a lot because myself, I was a victim and was quarantined. I was quarantined for over one week with no food, but thank God for action against hunger because they came to my aid. They came and supplied me and my family. They really tried for us. I learned a lot from the peer-to-peer -peer counseling training. That is where I learned to wash my hands. I did not know you just don't wash your hands any which way. I did not know there was a proper way to wash your hands. They taught us how to wash hands and I came back and I taught the nursing mothers how to wash hands, how to use masks. That you don't just use masks in any which way. When you are in crowded areas, you should use masks. And even when you're making food for your children, you should use masks. It has created a lot of impact on our lives. Now I see other women using masks too. They go to teach their children, they go to their children and teach them how to wash hands. When their children play, I hear the mother say, go wash your hands. All that is through action against hunger from when they came and taught me. The mothers respond well to the individual counseling because I have been teaching them and they are used to me and I am used to them. When I started visiting them, they were not responding well to me, but with time, they are used to me and they respond well. Anything I tell them to do, they do it. Even when I teach them how to feed their children, how to breastfeed, they take the information and they listen to me. So some of the challenges that we have faced here, I think people are facing everywhere. One of the major ones is that the messaging around COVID-19 uh, has changed over time. So this has led to a lot of confusion and mistrust of the information, especially around the IOICF practices that we're trying to promote. Uh, additionally, there are very high levels of misinformation circulating, especially through social media and WhatsApp. There's also general mistrust of the healthcare system in Sierra Leone. So we saw an initial drop in numbers of people going to the health centers for routine services uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And this was the same during the Ebola virus pandemic as well. Uh, and as in many people, as in many places, people here are experiencing pandemic fatigue. People are just less motivated to adhere to precautionary measures. And also the measures uh, that are promoted are difficult to follow in this context. As you can see from a photo taken the other day at a market, uh, things like social distancing are very challenging. And another major challenge in Sierra Leone is that people just don't believe that the virus is real. The caseload here is very low. We have only about 2,300 cases confirmed and 73 deaths. So obviously we have issues with low testing abilities, but really like the impact in West Africa has not been as um, significant as was expected. So people now just don't believe that the virus is real. Additionally, the pandemic has been very politicized. People think it's a government conspiracy to, in order to get money from international organizations, which also plays into the um, low level of belief. And lastly, it's difficult for our community members to procure IPC uh, materials such as face masks and hand washing stations, uh, largely because of cost. So this has been a challenge for our lead mothers and fathers who support community members to uptake these IPC measures when the people that they're working with can't afford uh, 
to, to invest in these. Next slide. Some of our key enablers for the reprogrammed activities uh, include the COVID-19 IYCF counseling cards produced by USAID. They've been hugely effective at helping communicate these messages to caregivers. Additionally, working with lead mothers and fathers to provide individual counseling has been very effective as their trusted voices in their communities. Um, Action Against Hunger, along with our partner, Cowick, we have staff that provide technical support and coaching to these lead mothers and fathers on the ground. So they go to the communities to provide monitoring and supervision and ensure that the quality of information and counseling is high. Uh, reaching the broader community through multiple mediums has been a big enabler for this program. This is especially important as people uh, reported hearing uh, information from different sources. So we were able to do community sensitization on COVID-19 through the community uh, question and answer sessions, through the PA system, through jingles on radio discussions, which helped spread consistent messaging. Uh, additionally, the government at both national and district level have been huge enablers for this program. The uh, Director of Food and Nutrition adapted IYCF protocols and messaging, which we use to uh, train lead mothers and fathers. And additionally, the district health medical team supported us uh, through helping run the community question and answer sessions and the radio panel discussions. Next slide. Uh, so what's working well, working with the lead mothers and fathers to provide individual counseling has been very successful. Uh, they already have the background knowledge in IYCF and care practices, so they uh, have the knowledge necessary for this role. They're also eager to be part of the response in their communities. Uh, individual counseling is also going well as it's keeping this uh, mother support group and father support group members engaged and the peer-to-peer -peer education um, is increased willingness to practice the recommended precautionary measures and IYCF practices. We've also seen an increase in the number of people accessing health facilities for routine services after the initial drop back in April. So mothers are attending their ANC visits and growth monitoring visits. Uh, and also we've seen a positive impact with the radio panel discussions. It's reading, reaching a wide audience and it's been good for participation. People are phoning in with their questions. Uh, and it's also, we've had good experience with the community question and answer format. It's a good platform for people to discuss what they heard about COVID uh, and get correct information. And it's been good for dispelling myths and helping people understand precautionary measures. Next Thank slide, you. please. Thank you very much, Christy. We're going to, yeah, the perfect timing. So that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So yeah, um, if you would please put your questions um, into the question and answer box and you'll see that some questions have already been answered um, there. But now we've got another really interesting presentation on IYCFE interventions in Lebanon. Um, this is ba Bayan um, from IOCC. Would you like to move forward? Thank you. Hi. I'm Ahmad, a senior field officer at IOCC. Uh, IOCC has been active in Lebanon since 2001, working, working to improve the health status of mothers and children under five years of age through community-based health and nutrition programs that address the needs of the most vulnerable. And today I would like to talk about IOCC, IYCF interventions and the emergencies that occurred lately in Lebanon, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, please. Uh, Lebanon is a country in the Levant region of Western Asia, and as the, the map shows, it's bordered by Syria to the north and east. Uh, nine years into the Syrian crisis, Lebanon remains the country hosting the largest number of refugees per capita. And according to UNHCR estimates, there are uh, 879,000 uh, 598 registered Syrian refugees dispersed across Lebanon. Uh, the present presence of such a large uh, refugee population placed enormous strains on the country's economic, public services, and local infrastructure. And in addition, in the past months, Lebanon has been going through severe economic challenges, which have been worsened with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as of today, uh, the number of people infected with uh, COVID-19 has reached 71,186. 
And then uh, came the unfortunate blast uh, in Beirut port that occurred on August 4th and caused more than 200 fatalities and 6,500 injuries. Next, please. IYCF practices uh, in Lebanon fall short of recommendations with only 14.8% of infants less than six months exclusively breastfed. Over 72% of children no longer breastfed after their first year of age. Uh, also, complementary feeding practices are extremely poor with only 41.6% of infants uh, introduced to complementary food at six months and less than 2% of Syrian refugee children from six to 23 months consume a diet that is appropriate for their age in terms of frequency, quantity, and diversity. Next. Uh, some recent rapid assessments led by IOCC in coordination with UNICEF show that mothers with infants less than six months are still using infant formula and products that are not optimal to feed their infants. And due to the current uh, financial and economic crisis, uh, data shows the reduction in number of meals, as well as a reduction in the consumption of meat, dairy, fresh vegetables, and fruits. Also, a recent Chan FBA report suggests 45% of pregnant and lactating women need support, including nutrition and breastfeeding counseling. Next. Uh, this pro project that I'll be talking about uh, today is one of the projects implemented by IOCC in Lebanon. Uh, this project is done in partnership with UNICEF, who are continuously working on building the capacity of their implementing partners and liaising with different stakeholders in the country. They are also the main contributor to build the, and strengthen the IYCF program in Lebanon with IOCC, the Ministry of Public Health, and other implementing partners. Uh, through this project, IOCC aims to support, promote, and protect IYCF in order to improve the nutritional status, growth and development, health and survival of infants and young children by the provision of IYCF counseling sessions and support to 10,000 pregnant and lactating women all over Lebanon. Uh, raising awareness on IYCF to reach 9,000 caregivers across Lebanon and referring mothers in need to the lactation specialists. Also by monitoring and supporting the hospitals enrolled in the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative Program and developing a complementary feeding material and building the capacity of the healthcare providers working in nurseries on the developed material. Uh, next. Um, there are many challenges that were brought by the different emergencies that occurred in Lebanon. Some of them were directly related to COVID-19 and others were brought by the blast and the economic situation. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to adjust the work modalities to ensure appropriate IPC measures are being followed. There was also a need to procure PPEs to all the staff and print IEC materials on COVID-19 to be disseminated at community level. Um, also, the IYCF counseling cards that were adapted by UNICEF uh, with COVID. Adding to this, the inability to conduct group sessions for a big number of beneficiaries and the need to obtain approvals for awareness sessions and home visits. Also, additional trainings on IPC and COVID-19 for all the staff were needed. Uh, due to the economic crisis, COVID-19, the heavy refugee burden, and on top of that, the Beirut blast, um, calls for uh, infant formula donations from the community have been also increasing as well, um, as well as complaints from mothers who have been affected by the recent explosion, dealing with challenges with breastfeeding. So several grassroots initiatives have emerged with willing willingness to provide support to infants and young children. However, they don't have the capacity or are not equipped to follow global guidance for humanitarian aid. Uh, just to note that our staff were hearing uh, that some mothers with COVID-19 were separated from their newborns in some hospitals. Next, please. What did we do to adapt to these challenges? Um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, all IOCC staff received necessary training on COVID-19 and IPC guidelines. Necessary PPEs were also procured to protect staff working on field and to reduce the risk of contracting COVID-19. 
the lactation specialist started focusing and following up on active and uh, suspected the cases of COVID-19 and uh, used the IYCF counseling card that was adopted with COVID by UNICEF. We had also to increase the frequency of awareness sessions conducted by the educators due to the reduction of the number of attendees per group, and this led to an increased workload on staff. For this reason, IOCC also mobilized volunteers and all governorates to help and support the educators in the awareness raising and coordination with municipalities. Alternative modalities to deliver key messages were uh, also put in place. Um, for example, individual meetings were being done face to face when possible while implementing social distancing measures and wearing masks. Uh, face to face awareness sessions were be being provided to a limited number of attendees, up to five uh, attendees per, uh, per, uh, per group or per session in open or well ventilated areas while implementing strict social distancing measures and wearing masks. Education and support also occurred remotely over the phone, social media, Zoom, Skype, and WhatsApp. IOCC also developed uh, the IECC materials, IEC materials related to COVID-19 and printed the WHO, UNICEF, and the Ministry of Public Health materials, and they were distributed at community level and uh, in shops, supermarkets, pharmacies, and other. Uh, next, please. Uh, here we have the pre and post COVID pictures where we had to reduce the number of attendees in the group sessions while respecting social distancing and IPC measures. And also to show that uh, when remote counseling was not enough to resolve the breastfeeding challenge, uh, the lactation specialists were visiting mothers taking all necessary uh, measures. Next. For the random distribution of uh, breast milk substitutes and the solicitation of donations, IOCC addressed this issue by reaching out to the formula milk providers to inform them on the importance of breastfeeding and build their capacity on how to be in line with the national and international guidelines of uh, the IYCF in emergency. IOCC also in coordination with the IYCF National Committee um, contributed in the development of an infographic on IYCF to communicate information quickly and clearly. Um, also the IYCF SOP to guide and inform agencies on how to ensure appropriate, timely and, sa and safe uh, uh, infant and young child feeding support in emergency. IOCC also in coordination with the IYCF National Committee set up the IYCF hotline number to report on violations of the BMS codes and to receive referrals for mothers in need to be followed up by the lactation specialists. Next. Since the start of the pandemic on February 21st until mid-October 2020, the lactation specialists were able to reach 9,000 uh, 9, women and provided them with uh, the needed IYCF counseling and support. Also, the educators were able to reach uh, 5,900 caregivers and provided them with education uh, on IYCF and COVID-19. Next, please. Here is the testimony. Uh, uh, just to say that, it's, uh, that uh, this is a testimonial from a mother who receives support from our uh, lactation specialist in South Lebanon. You can start the video uh, now, please. Um, uh, Brooke, uh, I think Geralda is going to give us the translation during the video or Nassim? Geralda, okay, go ahead, thank you. مرحبا أنا ليال رمال بدي أحكيكم عن تجربتي إني حبلت وولدت بزمن الكورونا حبلت بشهر 8 2019 وولدت بشهر 5 2020 بوقت كان كان في حالة طوارئ بالبلد وكنت كثير عاني من طلعتي لعند الحكيم بسبب التجمعات صرت أطلع بالأوقات الكثير طارئة بشهر 9 واجهت مشكلة إنه بطل خلاص يوصل الغزل البيبي فقلت قل وزنة واضطرت خلف قبل بوقتي خلقت البيبي وزنة 2 كيلو و 700 جرام 
بس بهذه الفترة كنت بدي أعطيها المناعة والقوة ما لقيت الحل إلا بالرضاعة الطبيعية وخاصة أنه نحن بزمن بوقت الكورونا كان في حالة طوارئ تعرفت على أخصائية الرضاعة أمل أمل جواد ساعدتني بدون مقابل ولأنه نحن محجورين بالبيت ما فينا نشوف حدا بالوقت اللي كانت ما قادرة تيجي لعندك كنا عم نتواصل عبر الفيديو كول والواتس أب أنا بتشكر جمعية أي أو سي سي لأن وقفت حدي ودعمتني خاصة أنا مرقت ببيبي بلوز كمان أخصائية الرضاعة كانت حد أمل جواد ودعمتني بهذا الموضوع من جهتي بحب بحب ساعد كل أم وأقدم نصايحي لكل أم حابة ترد Okay, thank you. And next slide, please. Uh, what helped us during adaptation is that IOCC has been an active member of the IOCF National Committee and the Nutrition Task Force. Uh, IOCC also attends the health working groups uh, nationally and in the targeted areas, and this also plays an active role in implementing the activities effectively. It's also good to note that a nutrition task force was created in Lebanon recently as part of the response to Beirut explosion, and this helped to coordinate, facilitate, and follow up on issues related to nutrition. Also, the IOCC management support helped by implementing appropriate actions and interventions to promote support and protect IOCF. Also, the quality of services provided by the staff, as well as the staff commitment and dedication to their work, also to mention that IOCC staff were always following the re recommended IPC measures to protect themselves and uh, people's health. Also the trust from the community and the long history and presence at the community level, which also led to stronger relationship with stakeholders. And um, what helped us also that people already had phones and there was uh, internet connection, which helped promoting the remote work. Um, next, please. Uh, as a way forward, we are looking at uh, more collaboration with more authorities to obtain approvals for awareness sessions and home visits uh, in order to reach more areas and beneficiaries. Also, the continuation of uh, community-based IYCF activities, which play an important role in improving the IYCF practices. Also, to continue the, uh, the advocacy with stakeholders to engage them in the awareness raising. And uh, finally, to advocate so that the Lebanese law that aims to protect and promote breastfeeding and the international code of marketing of uh, BMS are taken into consideration in all responses during and um, after COVID. Um, that's, uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Fantastic. Gosh, lots of lessons learned, lots of, um, yeah, how you um, adapted the programming um, within that context, within all the presentations. Um, show some similarities and some um, differences in ways that you can adapt. Um, Ashima from UNICEF headquarters will now lead the quiz. Welcome, Ashima. Thank you, uh, Deborah. And um, so now is the time to, we, we have heard a lot, so now it's the time to do some fun thing and also do some application. So Ben, can I request you to put the first question? So there will be three questions here. Uh, what we will do is uh, we'll just, uh, I will read up the question. Each question will have three uh, options. You have to choose one option and um, then we will see how you do that. So Ben, if I can Ash ask you. Ashimur, I've managed to put them into three separate polls so you can address each one. Oh, other. great. So we'll go with the first one now. So the first poll is up uh, and the question is in the experience shared from Syria, the first presentation, what is working well? There are three options. Uh, you can press the one you think is the right one.
Great. Ashma, there's, uh, yes. there's no set time, so tell me when and I will end Yes, it. yes, I, I, I will. I'm just giving 30 seconds. To Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm monitoring that time, so it's just... Uh, yes, yeah, so I hope uh, people would have responded to this. Um, ben, can we have the next question now? I think we're going to get the answers to this one. Oh, first. this one. The, well, okay? Let's just see. Let's just see um, what did, said, how did we do? And then I will discuss the answers as you presented. Yeah. So the majority of us, that is 58% chose the answer two. And I think as per my understanding, your understanding is correct. Majority of the people thought that advocacy by community leaders and support of mother support group was the thing which has been working really well as presented by our presenter from Syria. This is the one which worked well. The other two was to confuse you with the other presentation, which was the Sierra Leone one. So great job uh, for all the people uh, who chose the first one, the uh, second one. Can we have the second question, Ben? So the second question is uh, to reflect on Sierra Leone. What are some of the IVCF programmatic adaptations done in Sierra Leone? And you have three options. Please choose the right one. Okay, so let's see how did we do here, Ben? Can we have the results? Ooh, here we did almost the same as the first one. We had a large number of us thinking the way I'm thinking. That is both A and B. Yes, as we saw in the presentation, the lessons when they were talking about the programmatic adaptations, it tried both individual counseling by peer counselors using the counseling cards, as well as community Q&A and the mass media campaign. So Sierra Leone had great experience there and many of you were able to catch the answer. And the last question, Ben. Yes, so that is from Lebanon, which is very fresh in our minds, is how is the awareness and counseling on IYCF continuing by following the appropriate IPC measures? There are three options. Please choose the right one. Okay, so shall we see the results now? Ben, please help us. Oh, here we go. Majority of the people think the way I think that is 86 person. However, while, while hearing the presentation, I would also give full marks to people through group counseling because there, were a, there was a mention that some of the group counseling was tried with social distancing. So everyone got the full answer and that leaves us very happy. It seems all of us have been awake and listening very well. And thank you to the presenters for great presentation and clear presentation. Over to you then. Uh, you're on mute, Deb. Thank you, Ashima. It's always fun doing, uh, yeah, leading these polls and seeing um, the information that's provided. Now we're going to move on to the question answer session. Now, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that some questions have been answered in writing. Um, but Peggy is going to now. Peggy, um, will, I'll introduce her from J JSI or USAID. Um, Advanced Nutrition. Um, Peggy, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, Peggy will in, um, lead the verbal Q &A. session. Great. Uh, thanks, Deborah. This is Peggy Conis Boer, Senior Advisor with USAID Advancing Nutrition. We had a number of really great questions come in during the presentations, 
There's still time to add um, questions to the Q&A box. I'm gonna start with a, a question for Leila on the Syria program. Uh, there, was a, there were several questions related to the regulation of infant formula uh, donations by charitable organizations and, and a question about whether or not there is a, a reporting system for breast milk substitute violations. Leila? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have a formal channel which goes from the um, from the acting agencies to this uh, to the subsector to the sector, etc. Uh, but we have a lot of um, non-authorized local charities work who are not part of the sector during the onset of the emergency, which is why we had quite a lot of uh, BMS or infant formula uh, donations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um... Uh, Christy, this is a question for you about um, the Sierra Leone program. How was the rapid behavior assessment conducted when ACF had suspended all community-based activities? How were those 500 people reached? Over to you. Are you there, Christy? Okay, she is struggling with her connection. So we'll, we're, we'll turn to Bayan for a, a quick question and then we'll come back to Christy. So Bayan, are the lactation specialists uh, that are conducting the, um, uh, the specialists and the educators part of a government health worker program? Uh, no, they are not part of the government program. They are IOCC staff, the lactation specialists and the educators. But uh, we with the um, IOCF committee uh, have a list of uh, uh, lactation specialists from all the, 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 um, the organizations working uh, on, uh, on IOCF who have lactation specialists in their programs. And this uh, list is uh, uh, also, as I mentioned during my presentation, so when we receive uh, uh, a, uh, a call for a referral of mothers to uh, that need support in OSCF in breastfeeding or have any uh, uh, problems. So uh, the mother is referred to one of these lactation specialists. So this list uh, that includes a, a lactation specialist from IOCC as well is um, a nationally uh, is known nation nationally. Okay, great. I'm going to continue with another question that I think is for you. Uh, are you doing the nutritional assessment of nursing mothers? And if yes, then what is the most suitable nutritional assessment method during the pandemic? Uh, okay, so uh, what I mentioned during my presentation that we are uh, conducting rapid assessments with, uh, with the mothers. Uh, the rapid assessment was developed also with the UNICEF. It contains um, uh, questions about if the mother is exclusively breastfeeding, if she is uh, uh, mixing feeding, if giving her formula milk or other... Um, uh, um, if she has any challenges in breastfeeding, if she needs a referral to the lactation specialist. Also, we are asking about the, uh, the consumption of, uh, uh, of food. So um, this is the, uh, the assessment that we are uh, uh, using. Uh, and um, we, uh, we conduct it with, uh, we do it randomly, uh, with uh, not for all the, the, the beneficiaries that we are uh, targeting. We do it randomly in all governorates. Um, uh, either by uh, when we do the, the individual counseling or uh, through phone when we are contacting the mothers. Okay, fantastic. Um, Christy is having some problems with her internet. Hello, hello. Can, hello. Can I? Yeah. yeah. Can I tell you for Christy? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the assessment we were able to go ahead with the assessment with the support of a Yeah, I think that Mohammed, your connection is also weak. Yeah, let's let's 
Let's go ahead. I'll, I'll jump back to Leila for in staff, both um, okay. ACF staff and that's of uh, management team. We use them um, uh, this um, uh, um, uh, able to inform us and this. So the free staff we are used them. Um, yeah. Okay, Mohammed, I think you're coming in and out. So I'm going to jump to, to back to Leila for a question and then we'll come back to you or Christy, okay? Oh gosh. Um, so Leila, this is a question from Maria Marcos. Uh, she was uh, wanting to know if you could try to explain what the main barriers for mothers to breastfeed in the first half hour of after birth in Syria. Yeah, so this was alone. not, yeah, sorry. Uh, this was not part of uh, the presentation or, um, but um, in general, we don't really, uh, for us as a field office, we don't really have data on, on the rate. Um, we do speculate it's quite low and it's um, basically we operate in a very um, conflict heavy and uh, political, um, area where we don't really have one health sector, we have multi-layered health sector. So the integration of services between the, um, the maternity health care and the nutrition is not as simple and as, um, as easy as in other contexts. I can't really answer that directly. It's not part of the presentation. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, I'll have another question for you was about how well wet nursing and relactation are actually accepted in the wider community. Could you speak to any of the barriers that you've had to overcome? Yeah, so one of the advantages, I would say that we work mainly in rural areas and uh, people, uh, the people that we serve through IYCF come from a very conservative environment is that actually widely accepted. Um, it's a widely common practice for, for mother to help her neighbors or relatives in breastfeeding children. So the idea and the concept of those were, um, were widely accepted if it was with their neighbors and relatives. But then the, the further that you move, so when um, you can't really establish networks um, of wet, nurse, uh, wet nurses, because they would not, it depends heavily on what family you come from basically. So there's a lot of socio, uh, uh, socio factors into that. Okay, great. And then to you as well, Kwai uh, Zantun asked if any IYCF flip charts or counseling tools were used to support the relactation counseling. And what is the role of basic health staff and midwives in this nutrition activity? Yeah, so uh, a lot of our counselors um, double uh, had double roles, so they were the, the midwives um, that tended to the mothers who were in the reception area if we're talking about the same emergency. Um, we did use flip charts after a month of um, the onset of the emergency for visual aids, and we also used it in multilingual since we expanded this intervention to the foreigners. So um, we decided on translation of flip charts, which we contextualized the flip chart itself to accommodate Iraqis, Syrians, and the different nationalities. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, I think since we are having trouble with both Christy and Mohammed's um, audio, we, we, we may need to skip those questions. Unfortunately, there were some interesting questions that came in. If anyone has additional questions uh, for either Leila or Bayan, could you please add them to the chat box or the Q&A rather? Hmm. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. Do any of the, the organizers have a question or two for our presenters? Okay, Christy, are you back? <laughs> if not, I think it's over to you, Deborah. Okay, that's great. We've actually, yeah, sorry about that. Um, please note that the webinar presentation will be on the um, Tech RRT website. 
um, and um, the, some, the, some of the answers to the questions um, as well will be on there. Um, and if you have any um, questions you're wanting to know, um, you can get support through the GTAM Nutrition Cluster um, website um, as well and direct your questions through to program adaptations teams. Now, um, we'll go on, on now, Ben, um, would you be able to, yeah, so here are the details for this. If you require some guidance, have any questions um, about infant young child feeding program adaptations within the context. Now, um, Ben, are you able to share your screen for the survey? Yes, I am. So I'm just going to paste it into the uh, chat box and then I'll also share it on the screen. Fantastic. So I will read out the questions and if you'd be able... Um... Can you see that, Deborah? Yes, I can. So the Learning and Sharing Cafe I'll, I'll scroll down as you go. So if you could put your um, your names here, um, your country, your organization, and um, have you seen the um, frequently asked questions on breastfeeding COVID-19 by the World Health Organization? Have you disseminated um, this among your colleagues, if you have. Um, so please um, click on the link in the chat box to access the survey. Have you or your team or partners adapted the WHO frequently asked questions on breastfeeding COVID-19 to the local context? If yes, for which country and what languages? And can you tell us what were the major adaptations? Also, based on you and your team's experience, would you share comments and suggestions on how the WHO frequently asked questions could be improved? Now, these are really, this survey is very useful for us to be able to well support you um, and uh, other global um, advisors throughout um, on the program adaptations. So here's an example of um, being provided on how to complete the questionnaire that you'll see through the link in the chat box. Hello, Deborah. Can you still see that? Can you continue? Yes. So, okay. Have you seen the UNICEF, um, USAID, IYCF in the context of COVID-19 counselling cards and recommended package? If yes, have you disseminated or shared these among your colleagues? Have you, your team and or partners adapted the UNICEF USAID counselling cards to the local context? And if yes, for what country or region were the major adaptations made? And based on your team's, ex you or your team's experience, can you share comments and suggestions on how the UNICEF USAID counselling cards could be improved? And are there any other tools or social behaviour change materials that you think are needed to support IYCF programming adaptations? And if yes, what? Are there any more? Ben, are you able to scroll down? Is that? Yeah, okay. And if you'd submit your answers for those once that's completed. Fantastic. 
So we've, you know, we've had some really great, really interesting and diverse presentations today, and a lot of work goes into preparing these presentations. Um, so we really thank Lila, um, Christy, Mohammed, Bayan um, for their work with developing these um, presentations um, and for taking the time to contribute. At the, um, we'll close the session now. Um, if you want any more information, you can contact the Tech RRT at internationalmedicalcore.org. And if you go to their website, you will see the past and this current um, presentation. Um, this will be uploaded within the next couple of days. Um, when you've finished the webinar has closed, we'd really appreciate you completing the evaluation. Um, this helps us to make sure that we're providing the webinars or the cafes in the style and the information that you would like. So thank you very, very much for your attendance and we wish you all the best. <laughs>